Okay, here we are. Um, climate changers, here we go. I'm um, ready. Are you ready? I hope you're ready because I'm not ready. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, what we're going to do today, the stuff of life, matter, and energy. This is sort of uh, just a very bare bones um, chemical chemistry overview for you guys. Now, um, look, I understand this is a general education science class. My guess is that many people taking this class don't really like science and um, maybe um, have been avoiding it and they're scared of things like chemistry and physics and I sympathize with you. Um, my guess, here's my personal belief, is that if you fall into that camp, it's not because you're not able to like science um, or to understand science. It's probably because you had a bad experience with science. You've been traumatized by science and so that's why you're scared. And so my goal really is to try to make this stuff, which can be hard and dry and dull and complicated, to make it accessible to you. Um, so uh, chemistry is one of the more challenging parts of it and I wouldn't do it if it weren't really important. Um, we're talking about climate change. Climate change is happening because of some chemical things. So we can't really understand climate change unless we know at least a little chemistry. Okay, so that's where I'm coming from. And um, so you can see what I'm doing. I'm, I'm including pretty pictures. So that should help in telling jokes. Okay, uh, so chemistry. What's chemistry? Well, the interaction of matter and energy. That's a definition I just made up. But close enough. That's what we're going to talk about today. Matter and energy. Okay, and what are our learning objectives? To get just enough chemistry under your belt to understand the basics of climate change and how it is studied. Okay, so let's rock and roll. Let's get some definitions out of the way. Matter, that stuff. What is it? All material in the universe that has mass and occupies space. And so that's solid and the various phases of matter include solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. Okay, plasma, who? We don't see that very much around here. It's a very highly energetic form of matter. We see solids, we see liquids, and we uh, know that gases are around us. Okay, so um, there is this thing that the uh, chemists and physicists came up with called the law of conservation of matter, which is pretty simply stated, matter normally cannot be created nor destroyed. Okay, you can't make new matter. Uh, and you can't destroy it either. Um, you can destroy a building, but in the end, you're left with a bunch of rubble. You have the same mass. Um, you can do a chemical reaction. You can change um, compounds from one form to another, but in the end, you'll have the same mass available, the same uh, number of atoms, let's say. Okay, so that's simple. The law of conservation of matter cannot be created nor destroyed. Memorize it. Okay, what's an atom? Okay. Um, if you break things down to their smallest parts, the atom is the smallest unit of matter that retains the chemical properties of an element. Oh, great. So in, in defining one thing, we've come up with another word that needs defining, an element. I'm going to come to that later. Now, you probably already kind of know what an atom is. It's a little bitty tiny thing. It's the smallest thing there is. Um, and it is composed of, yes, a proton and a neutron and electrons. Okay, protons have positive charge and electrons have negative charge and if you wonder what charge is just play with a magnet one end is positive and one is negative okay and then neutrons are cool because they don't have any charge at all uh, and so really it's these charges that kind of determine in part the nature of the particular atom. So atoms come in different kinds. There are different kinds of atoms and the different kinds are called elements. So we're going to talk about them soon. So protons are positively charged particles. Neutrons um, lack a charge and electrons are negatively charged and they fly around the uh, nucleus like uh, a satellite around a planet only much much faster. I think they go around the speed of light. Uh, oh yeah, I know what else I wanted to say. This is not the smallest particle there is. Actually, these protons and neutrons, I'm not even sure about electrons, can be broken down into smaller things called quarks and subatomic particles, but we are not going to talk about them in this class, even though they have cute names like charm 
Anyway, okay, so the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons determine its chemical properties, what things it'll bond to, how heavy it is, and so forth. Okay, so we have the periodic table of elements. And so each one of these things is slight. It's, we start with hydrogen, which has one proton, helium with two protons, lithium with three, and so on and so forth, till LR, whatever that is, goes up to 104 um, protons in it. It doesn't tell you how many neutrons or electrons are, or, well, it doesn't tell you how many neutrons are in it. The number of electrons balances the number of protons. Um, and just so that to help you memorize all these, I have um, opened up Tom Lehrer's uh, song here. It's a good way to learn all the elements. I'm going to waste one minute and 24 seconds of your time playing it. So make sure you listen to this. There's antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and rhenium, and nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium, and iron, americium, ruthenium, uranium, europium, zirconium, lutetium, vanadium, and lanthanum, and osmium, and astatine, and radium, and gold, protactinium, and indium, and gallium, and iodine, and thorium, and thulium, and thallium. There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, and boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, bromine, lithium, beryllium, and barium. There's holmium and helium and hafnium and erbium and phosphorus and francium and fluorine and terbium and manganese and mercanium, molybdenum and magnesium, dysprosium and scandium and cerium and cesium and lead, praseodymium and platinum and plutonium, palladium, promethium, potassium, polonium and tantalum, technetium, titanium, tellurium and cadmium and calcium and chromium and curium. There's sulfur, californium, and fermium, berkelium, and also mendelevium, einsteinium, nobelium, and argon, kryptonium, and radon, xenon, zinc, and rhodium, and chlorine, carbon, cobalt, copper, tungsten, tin, and sodium. These are the only ones of which the news has come to Harvard. And there may be many others, but they haven't been discovered. Okay, I'm just kidding. You don't really have to memorize all that. But I tell you what, if you do, if you memorize all that and sing it in a video with a blindfold on, so I know you're not reading it, I'll give you an A in the class. No, I can't do that. I'll give you a little tiny bit of extra credit. And I will post your video to the class so everyone can see how cool you are. Let's move along. Times of wasting. Um, so just to remind you, on the periodic table of the elements, there's some numbers. See, uh, H, E, 2, and 4, and that stuff. So the number here, the big one in the top right, is the number of protons. It's called the atomic number. And the little number below it is called the atomic mass. And that is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So you see the number is always smaller than the mass. The number is the important one. It's the number of protons in it. Okay. Um, so, no, you don't have to memorize all of them, but yeah, I want you to memorize six of them because six of these many elements comprise 95% of all living stuff. So, for some reason, life itself has a, um, a liking for six of these, and we should know what they are. Here's what they are C H N O P S. C is carbon, H is hydrogen, N is nitrogen. O is oxygen, P is phosphorus, and S is sulfur, and I'm going to tack a couple more on calcium and magnesium. These things have a special name in ecology and biology. They're called the chemical macronutrients. Don't confuse these with nutrients, like I need vitamin A and I need protein. Those are important nutrients. I'm talking about chemical macronutrients. That's what these elements are. And look, one of them is C or carbon. Carbon is part of carbon dioxide and is part of methane, and those are important greenhouse gases. And there's the connection to this class. Okay, I hope you're seeing that now. You'll, I'll, we'll come back to them in a minute. I have more to say about chemical macronutrients. Uh, just some uh, close-ups of some atoms. Uh, they look the same if you blur your eyes, but if you look closer, you'll notice that this one, carbon, has uh, six protons in it, and this one here, nitrogen, has seven, and this one here, oxygen, has eight. Um, and they have different mass numbers, 12, 14, and 16, because of the uh, number of neutrons they have. Um, 
One thing I just want to point out, I'll come back to this soon. This carbon atom, notice it has one, two, three, four electrons in what's called the outer shell. That's important. That means it can bond to four other um, elements, um, if they're the appropriate elements. It can make up to four bonds with other things. And that gives it a particular shape, which is really, really useful, apparently, for living things, because they make a lot of use of those four bonds. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Okay, but there's something weird about elements. Every single element um, comes as different, uh, may have different isotopes. What is an isotope? It's an atom, a particular element, with differing numbers of neutron. So right here we have a hydrogen atom and ignore, yeah, let's see, wait a minute. Yeah, sure, we'll just ignore this one. And we're gonna look at this one and this one. They are both hydrogen atoms. They both have one proton, but this fella here has zero neutrons, and this one has one neutron. So apparently you can stick a neutron on, and it doesn't change its chemical properties because it doesn't change the charge at all. It changes its mass a little bit, but that doesn't really matter much chemically. And so it behaves as um, hydrogen, but it's it got a different atomic number. And so this one here is known as deuterium, and there's also something called tritium, and these are important for making hydrogen bombs, I think. Um, but anyway, those are called isotopes. So why are isotopes important? Why am I wasting your, well, I'm not wasting your time. Why do I think it's important enough that it's not wasting your time? Here's why. Isotopes t tend to be unstable. The heavier isotope emits some mass to become the stable form but it happens very, very slowly, maybe thousands of years to be reduced by half. So check out this graph, number of half-lives, well, percentage of parent isotope remaining. So at time zero, let this be time. At time zero, if we have all this heavier isotope, over a, a certain period of time, uh, half of it will be remaining, and that will be the half-life. And then over another period of time, half of the remainder will be gone, half and then half and then half again. And that happens very steadily. It's a probabilistic thing. And um, so cool. So isotopes have half-lives. And so if you have a machine that can record how much of an isotope is in something, you can figure out how old it is. Okay, so here, um, this, so that's called dating, radioisotope dating. And I have some examples of things that can be, that have been dated using radioisotopes. Here's one. This poor guy died of um, an arrow wound in his shoulder about 5,300 years ago. He died and then he got frozen and then he got frozen into a glacier and he was found, uh, I can't remember, 10, 20 years ago and exhumed and they're wondering at first they thought he was a dead mountaineer I guess in a way he was but not the way they were thinking um, and he was very carefully examined in a million different ways they found the arrow wound they found a little sack that he was wearing that had some fungus in it and some tinder maybe um, they looked at his clothing and they dated his body and found out that he was about 5,300 years ago using carbon-14 dating Here's another thing. How about just a fossil, a plain old old fossil? You can use radioisotope dating on rocks. Um, or we've talked about ice cores and the bubbles inside. You could, if you're very careful, extract those gases. And every bubble there has different gases in it. And some of them are composed of radioisotopes. And so you can date that as well. So this is a really super powerful method because it's important to be able to date things. It gives you really important information. And this will apply to climate change because especially with these ice cores, we're able to go back and sample old atmospheres of Earth back to about 900,000 years ago and figure out what the ratio of isotopes are to date them and also figure out what the temperature was at the time. We're going to talk more about this later on a special lecture on ice cores, but I just wanted to talk about radioisotope dating now because we're talking about chemistry and it's chemical. So um, as a critical thinker, you should say, oh, how do they figure that out? 
Me too. I always wondered uh, how, I mean, I can't see carbon 14 and carbon 12. I can't weigh it. How do you do that? So I Googled it around and I find out, found out that you, you do it using a thermal ionization mass spectrometer. Oh, rats. I forgot to, uh, oh, cool. I'm actually almost perfect. 15 minutes, but I forgot to start my clock. So wait, take a little break, stretch, and then come back. I'm going to have a sip of tea. <clears throat> okay, we're back. So what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, um, radioisotope dating. Super important for climate change. How do you do it? With a thermal ionization mass spectrometer? Ooh, my guess is if you're taking this class for GE credit, you're not a science major, and you do not want to know how this thing works. But... I could be wrong, and if you are interested in how it works, I can't help you because I don't really know. How would I figure it out? I Google it, which is what I did, and I looked like I could read this and kind of figure out how it works, but this is a machine that people are using to date fossils and old stuff and wood from old trees and um, human excavations and bubbles in ice cores and so forth, pollen. Okay, so that's how they do it in a very shallow way. Okay, so we were talk we were talking about the elements. Let's move on to molecules and compounds, the next level up in complexity. So a molecule is a combination of two or more atoms. So here's some um, uh, letters and numbers. O2 means two oxygen elements stuck together. The H2O, two hydrogen, one oxygen stuck together. This is water, this is oxygen gas, but careful here, the term oxygen is ambiguous because you could be either talking about the element O or the molecule O2. So if you're very careful in your language and you're talking about the stuff you breathe, you need to stay alive, that would be oxygen gas, not just oxygen, if you want to be really picky about it. Okay, anyway, those are molecules. A compound is the same thing as a molecule, except that two parts have to be different. Okay, so a molecule is composed of atoms of two or more different elements. So, for instance, H2O is a compound, but O2 is not. I think I say that. Yeah, okay, simple. Just got to get your words right when you're speaking chemi chemistry. Okay. Let's talk about some of the more important molecules in this class. Water is important. We've already talked about the weather and the water cycle. Carbon dioxide, of course, we'll be talking about it a lot for the rest of the semester. It is the most important greenhouse gas. Um, methane gas is also a very important greenhouse gas. It's much more potent on a molecule per molecule basis compared to CO2, but there's not as much of it being admitted, although it's significant and we need to pay attention to it. Um, sulfur dioxide, we mentioned them a little bit when talking about volcanoes. Uh, it's actually a cooling agent. Um, ozone, I should put a line through that. Ozone has nothing to do with climate change, but I throw it out there just to stump you. We'll talk about ozone a little bit in this class just as a model for how, of, for how humans can change the atmosphere in dramatic ways and how they can address that problem and stop it. Okay, There is hope. We can fix problems that we've started. Here's a model for doing it. I'll talk more about it later. And here's some things that I don't have chemical formulas for them. I could, but they're kind of um, uh, they're kind of complicated, too complicated. Carbonate is one. I'll talk to you about sodium bicarbonate soon. Um, humus is another. Lignin, lignin is another. Petroleum is another. CFCs. I'm putting out there. It's related to, to ozone. Why am I choosing these guys because they're stuffed full of carbon and we will be talking about the carbon cycle shortly um, and so and I'll define them later when I need to but I'm just going to put them on your radar screen for now these are things they are compounds and they're related to chemistry they have a lot of carbon in them Okay, wanted to say a little bit more about water. What a beautiful picture shows the huge oceans plus all the water in the atmosphere, which uh, is in tiny little droplets in these clouds. And as you know, the, um, there's water in the gas of the atmosphere. So um, 
just a very, I'm, I'm not going to go into this in much depth. I just want to show you one picture of a water molecule and what it looks like. A central oxygen atom bonded to, bonded to two hydrogen atoms. There's something funny about the charge of this molecule. It's uneven. So um, the H is a little bit more positive and this side of the O is a little bit negative. And so they're able to bond lightly with their neighbors. And that's called hydrogen bonding. We don't have to um, go into that in detail, although it's fascinating and it gives water a lot of its its important properties. But um, what I did want to say first of all is that water dissolves other things, which you know, but it's kind of unusual in its ability to dissolve so many things. Also, water has three phases, which you know, liquid, water, solid, ice, and a gaseous phase that you can't see. So that should not be news to you. But I wanted to point out, um, and we already talked about the water cycle, so I'm not showing it to you again, except over on the side here a little bit. Um, the ocean, which is a huge amount of water, is capable of absorbing a vast amount of both carbon dioxide and heat. So this incredible planet we have here, covered with water, is buffered in its temperature extremes. So it doesn't get too cold, it doesn't get too hot because this water is able to absorb a vast amount of heat without changing the temperature of the planet. A vast amount of energy it can absorb without changing temperature. That's pretty cool. Um, also, it can absorb a lot of carbon dioxide. So a lot of the CO2 that humans have emitted from burning fossil fuels has just been dissolved right into the water. It dissolves into the droplets in the clouds and falls out. It is having an effect. It's acidifying the ocean. And um, I guess that's the main thing, first of all. Second of all, uh, where are they going to go? Well, this some CO2 is we're starting to saturate the oxygen, uh, the carbon dioxide. Ah, we're starting to saturate the ocean with carbon dioxide so that more is starting to build up. So we have been buffered from the effects of carbon dioxide emissions by the ocean. Um, but we may be exceeding those limits, and that is something we need to model. Okay. Also, water can mobilize other elements such as nitrogen and carbon. And by mobilizing, I mean in many places, nitrogen and carbon are locked up in rocks. For instance, limestone is a carbonate. A lot of carbon is locked up and immobile in limestone, in that rock. But water, if it's slightly acidic, can dissolve that stuff and move it out. And then it goes someplace else on Earth. And so many of the biogeochemical cycles of our macronutrients, such as N and C, are um, occur in large part because of the action of water. So water is cool, which we all knew, but now we know why, one reason why. Okay, just to see water mobilize some carbon in front of your face, drop some baking soda in vinegar and watch it happen. And just for the fun of it, I decided to show you two videos. Here's one. Isn't she cute? Let's see. Channel. Um, by the way, subscribe to my brother, uh, Notiformit, his channel. Let's just watch her try to get some baking soda in her little toy volcano. She'll get it in there. It spills too much. Oh, no, it doesn't. All right. Get more. Oh, she wants to put some more in. Let's see her get the vinegar in. <laughs> ah, just kidding. That was <laughs> one of the fails. Stop this. Cancel you. Let's do a real one. Okay. This experiment shows what vinegar and totally randomly baking picked. powder I don't know do when are. mixed together. Vinegar is put in the bottle. And baking powder is put in the balloon. Okay. Oh, <laughs> How awkward. But they put it online so we can watch it. Okay. And see the foam coming up there? Yeah, okay. So that's carbon di <laughs> That's carbon dioxide being let off by the vinegar uh, from the baking powder. The balloon fills up from the carbon fills dioxide. Up from carbon dioxide from the mixture. From the mixture. Awesome. Good. Okay. <laughs> There's lots of these online. You should check them out sometime. Okay. Moving right along, I think. Okay. 
do 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 ah okay oh let's talk about organic compounds now be careful with this term organic because there's that grocery store thing that's not what we're talking about we're talking chemistry here organic compounds are carbon atoms joined with other elements okay that's how chemists think of this term organic now we have different kinds of organic compounds. They're hydrocarbons, which are strictly hydrogen and carbon. And we've got one here, methane, CH4. Here's some other ones. You don't have to know what they are, but notice C and H, C and H, only carbon and hydrogen. Those are hydrocarbons. And a lot of petroleum products, I think, are hydrocarbons. Okay. Um, let's see. And I'll talk about some other organic compounds. Biological organisms link carbon with a few other elements to form many different complex organic compounds, not hydrocarbons, but other things. And I just started out with this picture of carbon showing you the tetrahedral arrangement of bonds it can make. So this is actually a molecule of methane, CH4. But if we replace the H's with other things, we get other compounds. Okay, so these elements are called that these elements that biological organisms link to carbon are the chemical macronutrients. Okay, so just want to tell you some of them. You don't need to know these for this class, but since they're important, you know, you need carbohydrates and proteins, lipids in your diet. Okay, and your nucleic acids carry your DNA, your genetic information on it. So yeah, man, you should know something about it. So um, these are they are all organic compounds. Here's an important one: car a carbohydrate. It's repeating units of C, H2, and O, carbon and water. We're going to come back to this in my famous lecture, the equation of life on Earth. But so right now, I'm just going to kind of skip over these guys. Okay. So anyway, uh, living organisms are composed in large part of organic compounds, which are, as I mentioned before whoops, carbon atoms joined with other elements. Those other elements are the chemical macronutrients. Okay. Are you still awake back there? Wake up. All right. Pay attention. All right. So these chemical macronutrients move around the world in cycles that are vast in space and time. That's kind of poetic, isn't it? Vast in space and time. It's true. Here's one, the carbon cycle. Memorize it. Here's another one, the nitrogen cycle. They're vast in space and time. Now I don't have to memorize them yet. We'll come back to the carbon cycle. That is one I want you to memorize. You could start now if you wanted. Um, but instead of getting all complicated about it, I just want to tell you a, a little story to give you a sense of the vastness of space and time that one compound one of these chemical macronutrients can move in now let's start with sugar okay mmm sugar yum you can eat this stuff you love it it reduces your uh, stress hormones I think anyway and it gives you energy it's true it's uh, CH2ON it's actually C6H12O6 it enters you eat it you find it in fruits and vegetables I guess and you eat it and it goes into your body and your body burns it it actually takes it apart and releases the energy and captures it and lets you use it later on when you're thinking or using your muscles or whatever but the carbon that's in sugar goes somewhere conservation of matter it doesn't destroy it it just releases the energy in the bonds but the carbon is still there so the carbon needs to get out of your body and it gets out in the form of carbon dioxide now carbon dioxide is a poison to you so you got to get rid of it and if you don't believe me that it's a poison then chug um, a can of soda or a beer and then wait don't burp but then when you do burp make sure the burp goes through your nose not your mouth burp through your nose and you feel that horrible uncomfortable feeling that's because that's carbon dioxide that's carbonating your your drink and it's coming through some very sensitive tissues in your nose that go this is bad you're killing me with this carbon dioxide carbon dioxide goes off into the atmosphere and eventually it can be up there for a long long time co2 can be um, but eventually there are these magical organisms on the planet that can take that carbon dioxide out of the air and put it back in sugars and those things are called 
plants. Plants are totally awesome for doing that because they're taking the CO2 out and they're making sugars, which you need in part. You need other things too, but yeah. Okay, got it? So this is a mobilized, an example of a mobilized element um, that moves around the world in cycles vast in space and time. Hope you got that. All right, that's the best as I can do. All right, so that's it for um, matter, mostly. Let's say a little bit about energy. This is a picture of the sun. It's been filtered out, but it's roiling. It's full of energy, and some of it gets intercepted by the Earth, and we're the right temperature to be alive on, which is pretty cool. Let's define energy, and here's what Wikipedia says. <clears throat> it is difficult to give a comprehensive definition of energy because of its many forms. But one common definition is that, here's the definition part, it is the ability of a system to perform work. Good. So when you say I'm low on energy, that means your system, your bodily system, can't go to work. Not too bad. Um, a car uh, with a gas tank and all its parts working can do a lot of work. It could haul something heavy a long way. It has a lot of energy in it. Okay. Conversely, it would take a lot of energy to move something a long way. Okay. So that's energy. Here are some forms of energy. It comes in different forms. Kinetic energy, the energy of motion. When that billiard ball is moving down the table, it has energy. When it bumps into another ball, it can transfer that energy to the other ball. Energy of motion. Potential energy is the energy of something, the energy something has due to its position. Okay, so the boulder at the top of the hill has a lot of potential energy. It's not doing any work, but it could. Chemical energy actually is potential energy stored in chemical bonds. So sugar has complicated chemical bonds that have energy in them, take my word for it, that can be released. And if you want to test that, take a marshmallow, which is basically just sugar, corn syrup, it's sugar, and put it in the coals of a fire and let it burn. And you watch that, and it is going to give off a lot of potential energy. That's probably the best thing, the best use you could put a marshmallow to. I hate s'mores. Okay, then there's electricity and magnetism. Yes, of course, those are forms of energy. They can do work. And electromagnetic radiation, so light. Things like light, radio, microwave, x-ray, elect electricity shouldn't be there. Um, light, microwave, x-ray, uh, and radio, those are all forms of what's called electromagnetic radiation, and we get a lot of that from the sun, and that's going to be really important when we talk about climate change, climate, because our, the temperature of the Earth is largely due to incoming electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so, but there's some laws that govern energy, and you need to know them just like you need to know the law of conservation of mass. The first is that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Apparently, when the universe came into being, um, there was a certain amount of energy in it, energy and mass. And that, over time, has not changed. That's what they tell us. You can't create it nor destroy it. You can just change it from one state to another. But you can transform it from one form to another, but never perfectly, never 100%. That billiard ball going across when it hits another ball, the second ball is not going to go as fast as the first one. Something happened to a little bit of that energy. It was lost, not disappeared. It went somewhere else. Where, it, where did it go? Usually it goes into heat. So it's a little bit of heat. Heat. Is Time for a break. Take a little break, and this will be your last break, and then we'll finish up. We're back. Okay, thermodynamic law has two parts. The first part, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. And secondly, energy can be transformed, but never perfectly. A little bit is lost, and that's called entropy. I think I spelled this for you somewhere. Oh, just a special note. Under special circumstances, energy and matter are interconvertible. According to the equation that Einstein put forward, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Why not the speed of light? It's a big number. 
Um, and so that is what happens inside stars where fusion occurs and that gives off a huge enormous amount of energy and that's where when uh, boys with their toys played with uh, making bigger bombs they discovered atom bombs which is just nuts that's uh, that's another subject okay so we're talking about the thermodynamic laws um, and I just want to point out that there these are not violations of the thermodynamic laws they're just special situations but in general, um, energy can either be created nor destroyed. It can just be transformed. But when it does, there's a loss of, of not a, some of the energy is converted into entropy, random motion. So light can be turned into heat. That's, inter -con that's converting ener one energy from one form to another. Heat can be turned into light. Wait, light can be turned into heat. Well, sure, you go out and sit in the sun and you get warmed up by the light. Heat can be turned into light. So, um, hmm, how would you do that? Well, I don't know. Maybe this works. Um, you can burn a log. Okay, burning a log creates heat and also light. There might be better ways to do it. Um, you can turn kinetic energy into electricity. So, yeah, the kinetic energy or the potential energy of a water in a reservoir converted into kinetic energy of that water running through a turbine spinning something around can generate electricity um, and electricity can generate kinetic energy if you have an electric car you can move um, and electricity can be turned into light which we do at home all the time with our light bulbs okay so those are just some examples of um, interconversions of energy but at every transformation some energy leaves in some other form usually heat and that's called entropy so the never perfectly part of that second part of the thermodynamic law is known as entropy. Stated differently, here's how I prefer to think of entropy, is as a tendency in the universe toward disorder. So look, I'm almost done here, um, so make an effort to concentrate. We're going to return to entropy when we discuss the equation of life on Earth and this curious phenomena um, of the order which emerges from life. Life is a very ordered phenomenon, um, which is uh, seems to be an apparent violation of this thermodynamic law. If that makes no sense to you right now, don't worry. We're going to get back to it at a future uh, um, lecture, but I just thought I'd put that thought into your mind right now. What's the thought? If you look out at the biosphere around you, you see order, leaves are highly ordered, the veins in your hand very ordered, the neural impulses through your body, um, ecosystems are ordered things, and yet if there's a tendency in the world for disorder, how can there be order on earth? And it has to do with life and something really important that life does. We'll get to that. And it is related to climate change because carbon is involved. Okay, that's it, folks. Here are your words of the day, matter and energy, and there's also these will also be posted on the class. I will conclude with the joke of the day, which was, um, oh, I was, uh, I bet you uh, can't tell a joke about sodium, can you? Nah, that's the joke. Hope you got it. All right, see you later, bye.